Today is September 23rd, 2019, and thank you so much for meeting with me here in Halifax. Of course. Nice to hang out with you like this. Can you please introduce yourself? I'm Hannah Moskovich, and I'm a writer. Yeah. Uh, what sparked your interest in theater in the first place? Uh, you know, it goes in phases. I think when I was around, I think I was 12 or 13 years old, and I was in London in the UK, and I saw an open air production of Much Ado About Nothing uh, in Regent Street Park. And I loved it so much. That kind of, um, you know, middle school teenage love that you never get again in your whole life. And I made my parents take me and see it again, I think, or I paid to go and see it again. I loved it. And then when I was in high school, I read a play by Jean Rui called Antigone, and I, um, I adored it. And I adored Shakespeare when I was a teenager in particular. Fell in love with Henry V and Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth, Richard III. Yeah, so Shakespeare and Jean Rui. You said in one of the interviews that there are almost no dead female playwrights and that we live in a period of discovery of what it means to be a female playwright. So what does it mean? <laughs> Well, I think that um, you're granted a certain amount of uh, originality just because of what you are and because so much of the canon is um, male, you know, and there are identifiable male structures. So I would say, you know, it's easy to say, you know, it's easy to talk about because there's so many examples about Hamlet, you know, in come the wife and the girlfriend and out they go, and the mother, and in and out they go, and usually they're just there to complicate the plot for the men. And so any structure outside of that, where women just come on stage to complicate the plot for the lead male characters, is original, more or less. So it's really, you know, and I think um, a female perspective is probably overdue at this point you know, 5,000 years in, whatever we are. Oh. And what does it mean to be a Canadian playwright and write for Canadian audience and you know about Canada? Well, I think, you know, Canadians are often, because we have so many cultures nearby who are so dominant, like the US and the UK, um, Canadians are surprisingly underrepresented on our stages here in Canada. Um, you know, and it's different than other kinds of underrepresentation because we're not a marginalized group, we're a sovereign nation. And yet, I think, you know, for Canadians it's still um, enjoyable uh, to see themselves at all on stage or in any medium. Um, so I think, you know, I, I feel responsible towards that because I am Canadian and I feel like it would be nice if our theater, you know, if our theater represented us. And so I do take that fairly seriously, oddly enough. I mean, I didn't at first. So when I was first writing, I was much more preoccupied with um, just writing a good play and how you do it. And I think as I've gotten older, I've been more interested in uh, writing specifically about comedians, partly because I've become so aware, because I've sat in so many audiences, that Canadians appreciate it and that it means it's meaningful to them to see themselves represented because so much theater, so much theater is from the U.S. Like, every Canadian has seen a million productions of, you know, Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller and Chekhov and, you know, Shakespeare and even, and you know, contemporary American and British playwrights too, you know. We get, we are colonial country, theater-wise. So it's nice to, uh, it's nice to just show Canadians ourselves. How do you find your characters' voices? Um, (laughs) 
I'm struggling to answer because there's so many ways I could potentially answer that question. Um, I think, you know, uh, characters' voices is my generally the way that I am able to access writing. And so for me, characters, the voices of characters and the idea for a piece are sometimes less easy to speak to because I'm more on instinct there. Whereas there are other parts of my craft that I work really hard for, like structure, um, where I'm, I'm a weaker writer. And so I am more aware of how I do it because I've had to learn it, you know, piece by piece and build an understanding for myself. Whereas I think, you know, when I started writing, characters' voices always came and I didn't struggle for that. Um, but I would say, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to build authentic, um, complex psychology. Uh, you know, a, you know, a complex, authentic psyche of a character is important to me, with contradictions and with, uh, you know, um, odd behaviors are usually a part of the psychologies and um, actions of my characters. Um, I think, you know, I think, you know, within how I express characters, a lot of my worldview shows itself, you know, that I think people are fairly irrational, that I think that they are capable of both good and bad behavior, you know, even on the same night, that people are, in, you know, flexible, incredibly flexible, and that there's very little comprehensible about humans. Um, so I'm often trying to show that by uh, my characters. My characters reflect that worldview, I'd say. Um, I don't know if that answers your question really, but I would say, you know, the first thing that comes to me in Little Fragments is the sound of the character. And then from that character I'll get everything else. So it's the hardest, it's much harder to speak to character than anything else for me. Because it's just so close to how I generate. So characters come first and then the plot, or...? Yeah, always. Um, and uh, it makes, yeah, I think, you know, that's often the case for playwrights, for whatever reason, you know. Um, because the medium lends itself to big, bold characters and to interpersonal conflict being the sort of source of conflict, unlike, you know, TV or movies where there can be a volcano erupting and that's your source of conflict, right? Or in novels where a struggle with the self can be at the center of the action. Plays tend to be dominated by interpersonal conflict, and so character matters a huge amount. And character, and the conf conflicts between characters dictates action on stage, at least for me. I can't divide character from action, and in fact what I find is when I'm writing on TV shows where character is less important, I have a, I struggle, I can't do it. So character is absolutely, I, I can't, I can't maneuver or function as a writer without character. Do you use index cards when you write? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I mean, no. I just don't. I don't know what I use. I don't know what I use. Not index cards, though. Mm, I use a laptop, and I use a lot of notes to myself. So like I write sort of endless notes and when I leave a draft I'll have like pages and pages of notes in a side document that I will write to myself about where exactly I'm at and like all my questions and anything I don't know about and anything I'm checking on and any research I have to do and any dramaturgy that's come up and my, my notes document will sometimes be the same length as the play by the end. Like it'll be pages and pages and I'll cross notes out. Like I have a whole system for notation that goes along with my playwriting for sure, but it's all on computer, there's no index cards. Uh, how do you choose the time span for your play? Like, you know, is the action like, is it only like one day, a year, or I don't know? Good question. I tend to choose broader time spans than, um, you know, there's a lot of playwrights that will choose a fairly short time span, especially if they're working within naturalism. So it could be like 24 hours. And there used to be the, you know, the old unities included 24-hour time period for the whole play to take place. And I tend to break that rule or principle. I, um, I tend to span years and years and years in characters' lives. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think I'm interested, again, in like... Uh, 
and this is maybe also what we're seeing in terms of character, like I'm really interested in the subjective experience of a particular character, so I tend to not do naturalism. I tend to go through a particular point of view of a character, partly because I have a hard time believing that there is an objective reality <laughs> outside of your character's point of view. And so I tend to go through a character, but then I'll show them that character in a process of sort of transformation, but that will sometimes take place over many, many years. Sometimes my plays span 20 years, in, but you know, the, what links those time periods will be the transformation of a, of a character um, and how they're transforming over time or like, you know, how they're going through, their character is transformed through the crucible of time. Um, yeah. No, so I have a tendency to really like, yeah, I have a tendency to expand out through time, for sure, in a way that I think is specific. I mean, some playwrights do it just less. And how early in the process do you know where the action will take place? I mean, you have so many different locations, different countries and... Oh, me? Yeah. Have you read my work? <laughs> a little bit? <laughs> as well as you probably have. Um, <laughs> but not everything, so you know. <laughs> but you would have had to read two things to know that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it. Um, something else that helps me to work for sure is the world and a feeling of like knowing, <laughs> of knowing, having a sense of a world. Like so, you know. You know that will come with voice, honestly. Where the the character, will, what will come, will be you know, a sense of, like, where that character is placed in time, and maybe because my parents are um, social scientists, you know, I have a, you know, an, uh, with a character's voice comes their socioeconomics, you know, so it's hard for me to view people outside of circumstance, so character and circumstance are always sort of, like, um, auto-catalyzing in my work. I think, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I... So, you know, I, I think a person is, a, you know, a product of their environment, essentially, to whatever degree, you know. And so if I set, you know, a piece in a small, you know, German community of ex-Nazis living in Paraguay, that comes with the voice of the character from the get-go. So I think, yeah, setting and character are linked for me because I don't see character as set. Is easily separated from environment. If that makes any sense. Of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> totally makes sense. <laughs> I was wondering how long does it take you? I know, like the research. If you don't know much about this place, like how do you find out what it really feels like to live there, like to grow up in this place? You know, to be a product of this environment. Yeah. So my research, I write research heavy work, and sometimes like the research is years of work. Yeah, I sometimes do a lot of work. I wrote one play called This Is War that was set in Afghanistan in the military, two environments I didn't know anything about. So it took a lot of interviews with a lot of returning soldiers from Afghanistan to sort of understand anything about what I was writing about. And I had written on a show called Afghanida for CBC Radio, and I wrote on that for five years before I tried to write a play about it. And then I sort of... Um, I hired military experts to work on the piece with me so that I would, um, you know, have the jargon right. But beyond the jargon, have the environment and the circumstances right in terms of sort of all, like in terms of the war in Afghanistan and in terms of the experience of Canadian soldiers in particular and of, you know, what it's like to be in the military. So it was a lot of work. Um, yeah, it was a lot of work for one play. Can you tell me a bit about the relationship between playwright and dramaturg as opposed to consultants? Like oh yeah, good question. I mean, I'm looking for different things, different types of help or support. Um, with an expert, I'm looking for the the specifics of their area of expertise. So I've worked a lot with experts. Like I worked with um, a theoretical physicist on one play because I had a character who was a theoretical physicist. And um, I've worked with, you know, military um, expert consultants. But then what I'm looking for when they read it specifically is, you know, you know, I'm looking for them to a certain degree, first of all, to give me enough information to start off with that I can write, and then afterwards to read it and tell me where I fucked it up. 
you know, that is essentially what you're looking for. You're looking to have your, you know, you're looking for them to like tell you all the ways in which what you're doing is wrong. And uh, yeah, but specific to that field, whereas with a dramaturg, what I'm looking for is, you know, clarity of story. I'm looking to tell the dramaturg what I hope that the piece is communicating. And then I'm looking to ask the dramaturg to tell me if the piece is communicating that. I'm also often relying on dramaturgs like, for things like, yeah, a lot of it is clarity. And then a lot of it is just more or less. Like, has this gone on too long? Does this piece need to be expanded? Does this piece need to be contracted? That's a lot of what's helpful. Um, especially with my work when I'm trying to create an ambiguity, I'm trying to open up two possibilities in the mind of the audience or more, I'm looking for a dramaturg to tell me like, because with ambiguity you can just tip into it being totally incomprehensible quite easily, um, so I'm looking for the dramaturg to tell me like, have I opened up two possibilities in the minds of the audience or have I just totally confused them? So I'm looking for that kind of information. And then I'm also like looking for, is this original? Like, is it surprising you? Is it, um, you know, like I'm looking for effect. Like I'm looking for like, how do you feel at the end of it? Like, do you feel sad? Do you feel, you know, because I'm hoping that the effect on the audience matches what I when I set out to create in terms of effect. So it, I'm, I'm looking for story information with a dramaturg and structure information. Whereas with an expert consultant, I'm looking for them to advise me specifically about their field of knowledge and to, and to kick my ass, like to be like, you know, you're an audience member coming to see this who's in the military, tell me, like, tell me all the things that they're going to tell me, like my audience will tell me that I've gotten wrong, yeah. And if someone is just like starting out and doesn't have, you know, much connections, where do you find the consultant or dramaturg? And how early in your career should you ask for help? I mean, okay, so with expert consultants, I would say um, if you're writing, if you're, if you're writing a research-heavy piece, you use expert consultants. Um, you know, if you're writing outside of your area of knowledge or expertise, use expert consultants, you know. Um, hold yourself to a high standard in terms of what you're putting on the page. So I think that that is, you know, irregardless of whether you're emerging or you're established, that would be, that would hold, at least for me, like, you know, if I generalize for myself and how I, <laughs> but I, you know, I think um, with dramaturgy, I mean, it just depends, right? Like, I like a lot of support. It so depends on the individual playwright and how they work. You know, I like to work and get a draft out, and then I want to sit there with dramaturgs and have them tell me, like, what have I communicated? What's working? What's not working? You know, I want to I want to hear from people at that point, and I want to do workshops. Some people, that's not their way forward. They want to, you know, put it in a drawer for a while or just sit on it for a while and then come back to it. And they can kind of almost be their own dramaturg because they've refreshed themselves. Um, and refresh their point of view about their own work. So I don't know, I mean, in dramaturgy, um, some people write so entirely on instinct, I think, that they don't even necessarily know how to integrate notes. So when they work with a dramaturg, it won't necessarily help them because they don't, they can't, they can't take a set of notes and use those notes to revise their draft. That's just not how they work. They just write, you know, they were just an animal about it. And I think I used to be more like that. I used to be more, uh, less methodical. And I'm not actually sure what's better or worse. I mean, in the end, I don't think either is. It's really just whatever makes for a good, a good piece of theater, right? So in terms of dramaturgy, I think it so much depends on the individual playwright and, and, and their process, regardless, again, of whether they're emerging or established, I would say. Why did you decide to write plays? I mean, you could write books instead or for TV shows. I totally should write books for TV shows, is the truth. I do write for TV, um, so I do that. I've never written novels, pro probably partly because I'm scared to. <laughs> um, it took me a long time to master or to feel good about writing plays, like a long time of writing many, many plays. So every time I go into a medium, I feel a bit like, oh, fuck. 
I'm going to have to learn how to do this in front of people, and I'm going to have to go through a process of figuring out which of the skills I already have in terms of writing are going to transfer and which are not, and what this new medium is, and what its strengths and beauties are, and where it cannot go as easily. So, But I think, you know, I there is something about theater that I do really love. I, I don't know. It's the first medium I worked in, and so I think it's hard to let go of your first love. And I would say I really do like to sit in live audiences with my work and see the impact on the audience, that there's an addictive quality to that, whereas with books and TV and radio and other mediums I've worked in, essays, I've written some essays, you don't get that fix of an immediate response from the audience. That you, you sit there with them and you hear them respond and take in what you're what you've communicated and there's something about that I I am one of those writers who spends a lot of time sitting with audiences and like um, assessing them and assessing what they're getting and what they're not getting and I think I'm a like I'm a real theater professional like I I work really closely with directors and designers and performers I work with sometimes the same directors designers performers over and over again to try and craft something on stage that will communicate a specific way with the audience and I'm less about the pages and more about like, is it working when it's up on stage? So I'm much more oriented towards production than I am towards text. And that's not necessarily true of other playwrights, you know? It's a medium where there's like a broad range in terms of playwrights and how they deal with it and what they view as the art. So I don't know, I mean, I like to write in other mediums, but I do always come back to theater, I think, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I wish I wouldn't. <laughs> I wish I would just go and write, you know, for one of those bigger mediums. Speaking of immediate response from the audience, what do people tell you after the show? Like, can you share any highlights? Like, if people recognize you, you know, and see you at stage door in a theater. <laughs> it's a hard question to ask a Canadian because then I have to praise myself and I can't do it. <laughs> I have to admit to the nice things people have said. Um, I mean, I put on a show not that long ago um, and it, it actually doesn't have a text. Like, it, it does, but we would never divide the production from the text and it's called Secret Life of a Mother and it premiered in 2018 at Theatre Centre and it's a co-creation with me and Meg Beatty and Henri Kerr and Miranda De Beer. And um, it's a confessional piece, like it is about myself and Mev Beatty, who is a performer, she plays me, she plays Hannah Moskovich. And she, tell, like, she tells you as me about motherhood. And, uh, I would say like that, that that piece has had maybe the most obvious impact on the audience that I've seen, like where I you know, I can stand backstage and see that everyone I can see them all sitting there crying and talking. So that one's really moving because I can really see people just um, like de like devastated in the audience because I can stand backstage and just watch everyone at the end of the show because of the set. So I'd say like I think in that case it's just because I've said a bunch of stuff that's taboo that women don't normally um, talk about and so that has an impact on the audience just to have said those things to them. What is it like to collaborate with your husband? <laughs> All your questions are making me laugh. I laugh every question you ask. Um, is it a good thing or...? No, it's good. Okay. It's because they're like good hard questions. Um, I, I mean, I'd say that the good side of it is um, that he's talented. He's really talented. Really good at it. Uh, good at everything. Good at all the parts of it. You know, and I think directing is a composite skill. You have to be good at a bunch of different things and you have to be able to synthesize your ability to be good at all of those things into one vision. Writing feels like less of a composite skill. There's some composite elements like researching and then you know writing and then can you revise based on notes. Like there's some composite elements. Working with actors, you know, being having enough of an even temperament that you don't 
fucking freak out and yell at everyone. I don't know. There's a couple of things you need to be able to do to be a playwright. But directing feels super composite, and so it's rare to find a director like Christian who is good at all the things um, uniformly. Um, really good at lighting. Really good at sound. Really good at working with performers. Really good at having a vision for the piece and creating an event. Um, that's the upside. <laughs> the downside is working with my husband. <laughs> but I'm addicted to it, and I think because because he's talented and so it's hard for me to let go of he's so talented that I can't not work with him <laughs> but I would like to not work with him because <laughs> because it you know it like you can now you cannot like you the, the, all of the f struggles from work transfer to the personal world and when you have a child you know you're just in a chaotic mess of work and personal life being all intertwined together and also when we're both work like we have a child together so like our son is there and if we're both in tech that means our son is not going to see us for those 16 hour days because we're both in tech at the same time so it has it, like literally there are logistic challenges with having a child with your director that are surprising and not necessarily what you would think but also if we both work on a show say that's in Victoria we have to take our kid out of daycare and go to Victoria with our kid and set up daycare there. It's just a nightmare. Don't work with him. <laughs> it's a nightmare, but I keep doing it because I think I, I, he's good at it. He's just too good at it for me not to. Is there anything you would like to talk about? We have about like eight minutes left. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I can't think of literally anything. Well, I mean... Um, no, I mean, I can never think of things that I want to say off the cuff, honestly. I'm a writer, so <laughs> I can't, I never, whenever anyone asks me that, I'm always like, no. Is there anything you wish you knew when you were just starting out? Like, you know, maybe some aspiring playwright will watch it and like, what should they know? Um, I think, uh, I think, you know, like, <laughs> for better or for worse, like, there is a kind of, um, relentlessness required, um, and I think it's easy, or it would have been easy for me to be discouraged at a number of points along the way, and, you know, the first pieces I put up were not good. They weren't, and they got badly reviewed, as they should have been. Um, and I did get better, but partly because I'm there, I kept going despite that. And I think that's a fairly pat, like an ordinary thing to say in a way. And yet, I think a lot of playwrights stop after enough, after you know, enough discouragements. And for whatever reason, I just got. I think you know. Yeah, you, there is a kind of relentlessness that's required if you really, yeah. And I mean, for me, like, I put up my own work. So I put up my own work over and over and over again until a more established company started to notice me and put my work up. But that was a, like, that was like a eight-year process. <laughs> Five years of that I waitressed. So it's not like, I guess I would say that, like, it takes a while, and it's okay for it to take a while, and it's okay to write badly at the beginning, and in the middle, <laughs> do you know? And it's okay if it takes a long time for things to go your way. It's normal. I was 29 when I had a, my first professional production, and I've been trying to be a writer since I was 18, so there you go. Are there any psychological tricks that help you to write? Yeah, lots. <laughs> I think, you know, writing is hard, honestly, like, um, but the main source of difficulty is mental, you know, like it's a bit of a mental game. Um, you have to convince yourself that you can do it daily. Um, 
And I sometimes think that there's like an odd, you know, quality that athletes have that's similar. Like you have to convince yourself you can go out there and score. You can go out there and like hit a home run. You can get that puck in the net. Canadian, I should use hockey. Um, you know, you, you have to have a certain amount of confidence. So honestly, I think like the mental game is all about confidence and having confidence that you have something to say, that you, what you, how you think about the world is original and meaningful. And so like figuring that out, like what you, what, what the point of all of this is, for me that was important. But then I have like ugly tricks. Listen, if my writing's going badly, I'll drink a lot of coffee. I'll, <laughs> I'll come five o'clock, you watch me open a bottle of wine. If I have to keep working, um, I'll do that. Like I'll, all my mental tricks are about like coaxing myself into writing. So like it's even small things. Like I'll read the first few pages of, um, like I'll reread my draft um, to give me confidence. Like, okay, it's sounding good. It's sounding like I believe in this. Or I'll sometimes like, I'll just say to myself, you know, just open the document. You don't have to work on it. Just open the document and then I'll just work. But it's a good mental trick to make myself do it. Sometimes I'll be like, I'm just going to research. You know, if I've gotten scared of a draft or I'm scared it's not going well, I'll just do research until, and then I'll slowly get myself to start working on it. So I'll use like basically any, I work with my own fears and my own need for confidence a lot. And I do a lot of work psychologically to like get myself there. I bribe myself a lot. Yeah. And the last question. <laughs> How do playwrights get paid? Like, not how much, but like, you know, how? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, well, so, um, a lot of the time I'm working on commission, and I find that helpful because there's a deadline, or there's a set of deadlines attached to the commission. So, um, uh, the commission will range in amount, but, you know, these days I would say, I mean, I'm, I've been at this a while, but I would say these days, um, in the ten to $15,000 range for a commission. So that's money for you to write the play before anything's happened, and that's money you'll keep no matter what. Um, it's not an advance, it's a commission, so they're paying you to work on it. Um, unlike a novel where you usually are getting an advance against royal, uh, royalties, future royalties. Um, and then the next way that you get paid is s some theaters will compensate you for your time doing workshops. And then, of course, royalties. And so if your play, uh, when, in, when your play premieres, you'll, you'll get paid you know, a certain amount as a guarantee for the size of the theater you're in. And then should your play sell beyond that, you'll get 10% of the box office. And then should your play go on and do well, have five or six more productions or more, then each time it goes up, you'll receive royalties for each production. So that's how I get paid. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's any other elements. My, my plays are published, so if so, I get royalty checks for the, my published work as well. Um, yeah, I feel like there's something I'm missing, like there's some other element of being paid for being a playwright I can't think of, but that's the main way. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yay, thanks for talking to me. This is the end of the interview. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>